Baltazar Ushka and his son-in-law are making their way along the narrow path that snakes up to the glacier on Chimborazo. Baltazar has lost count of how many times he's ascended the inactive volcano. For the last 50 years, he's been chipping and carving out ice from the ancient glacier to sell at the market down in the nearest town. It's punishing work at an altitude of 5,000 meters. The two men are the last remaining ice merchants on Chimborazo, the highest mountain in Ecuador. This is the mountain that inspired Alexander von Humboldt to radically change his view of nature. And it was the starting point of our own journey, a journey in which we followed in the footsteps of the pioneering explorer in South America. People here at that time, they were more afraid of the volcanoes. Probably they think this guy is crazy about trying to go to an active volcano. Humboldt was fascinated about, about the, the volcanoes, that's why he decided to climb. Humboldt's perilous expedition along what he later dubbed the Avenue of the Volcanoes produced the realization that molten rock from the Earth's interior reaches the surface by way of such volcanoes. His insights delivered an explanation of the mechanism of formation of South America's mountain ranges. The explorer's travels took him deeper and deeper into the tropical wilderness. He was particularly fascinated by the continent's indigenous peoples, and he was eager to learn their language and study their lifestyle in the jungle. If you want to hunt, you must respect the rainforest and ask the rainforest to provide the food. If you are not respecting the rainforest, the rainforest will never give you nothing. Humboldt's scientific curiosity knew no bounds. He was even prepared to drink curare in the name of science, a potentially lethal plant-derived toxin used by the Achuar tribe for their poison arrows. His theory was that the toxin only worked if administered via the bloodstream, and he lived to prove it. Humboldt spent two and a half months following the course of the seemingly endless Orinoco River. The boat journey was full of hardships and hazards. Once he narrowly escaped with his life in a shipwreck in the river's rapids, remarkable given that he had never learned to swim. On the water and on land alike, Humboldt studied the region's exotic plant and animal life, measuring and collecting everything he encountered. In the forests of the Amazon basin, Humboldt was the first to observe that nature's species were locked in a relentless struggle for survival. This in an era when his fellow Europeans believed that nature was a well-oiled machine 
in which each animal had its God-given place. I think we, we lost this. We lost the naturalists, the people that were able to describe everything from different disciplines, like Humboldt. Humboldt was geologist, was botanic, was a zoologist. And, and now we are very sp specialized. We, we work only in one molecular, we work in one species, uh, and we, we lost this. We lost this uh, holistic approach that Humboldt had. For all his fascination with the diversity of the tropics, Humboldt could not turn a blind eye to the suffering of the human inhabitants under Spanish colonial rule. Appalled by the brutal treatment of the indigenous and African slave laborers, Humboldt wrote a scathing indictment of slavery on the continent. His books were subsequently banned in some countries and colonies. The presence of this explorer in the colonial empire was hugely important. His persistently critical stance on slavery saw him join the ranks of a group of progressive thinkers in the early 19th century. They all had a new notion of liberty, and owning slaves had no place in it. After five years, Humboldt's adventurous expedition through the New World came to an end, with enough material for the naturalist to work on for a lifetime. In his magnum opus Cosmos, he embarked on the revolutionary attempt to explain the entire material world, from minuscule life forms on Earth to the most distant stars. I would define it with one word, interaction. So this, I would say, summarizes absolutely his main impact in the history of science. Because uh, before Humboldt, everybody was uh, working on the classification of isolated individuals. And then he comes with this idea of connecting individuals while everybody was uh, separating the elements of nature, he was connecting them. So if you harm one element, you harm the others. So I would say that's the main idea on why Humboldt should be a reference on nowadays ecology. We return to the starting point of our journey, Ecuador's highest mountain. The already laborious job of the ice merchants on the upper slopes of Chimborazo has become even more challenging in recent decades. In order to reach the ice, Baltazar Oshka and his son-in-law have to climb higher and higher up the volcano. A team of international researchers has concluded that over the past 200 years, the glacier has receded by almost 500 meters. The team's expedition to Chimborazo produced a range of plant and rock samples that they then compared with those on Humboldt's famous Chimborazo map. The results showed that the glacier is indeed disappearing. The researchers see global warming as the primary culprit, something Humboldt warned the world about over two centuries ago. In an era when modern industrialization was just beginning, Humboldt was already predicting disastrous consequences for future generations. Technological progress and growth require an unceasing supply of fresh resources at the expense of the environment. Our planet has suffered permanent damage, as is evident today in the air, the soil, and the ice. And every year, we pump a further 37 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the Earth's atmosphere. In the face of an impending global climate crisis, Alexander von Humboldt's visionary insights into nature seem more prescient than ever.
the explorer and naturalist documented, measured, and mapped every corner of the new world. And he issued a challenge to later generations. Nature must be experienced through the senses. Those who merely observe and reach abstractions can spend a lifetime classifying plants and animals and believe they can describe nature, but will remain alien to it. <laughs>